My American dream and hunt will begin in the Chichuahuan Desert in Arizona, which is the largest desert in North America. This outstanding and still wild landscape is home to over a hundred species of reptiles and amphibians that I haven't yet had the chance to meet. Among these species, Phrynosoma solare, a horned lizard famous for its ability to spurt blood from its eyes when it feels threatened. More importantly, there are 13 species of rattlesnakes, including Crotalus atrox, one of the most emblematic, which I'd really like to add to my encyclopedia. Strange, mysterious, and sometimes dangerous, reptiles are nevertheless fascinating. My name is Nathaniel Mori. I'm a photographer and a herpetologist. I've decided to roam the planet alone with 15 kilos of gear in a backpack to photograph reptiles and amphibians, whether known or unknown to this day. My project is to create a detailed encyclopedia of all these species before they disappear. That's the challenge I've set for myself. My journey through Arizona begins at the rocky foothills of Dragoon Mountains. Then I'll travel to the west to Coronado National Park, an area punctuated by splendid canyons, and finally to the Sonoran Desert, famous for its giant cacti. This is a semi-arid biotope. This means that there are forests here, but they don't grow much. Rainfall is 80 millimeters on average per year. What's interesting is that nature has completely adapted to the aridity of the area here. However, during the rainy season, nature explodes here. Trees, flowers, branches grow new leaves, insects hatch and the frogs eat them. Everything happens in a very short period of time. It's like a race for life. So, on a hot day like today when the sun beats down, you need to search among the shadows, under the trees, between rocks and inside crevices. This is just the ideal spot. There are tons of hiding places potentially teeming with animals. In this kind of situation, you turn stones over in the hopes of finding a snake or a lizard hiding underneath. You have to look everywhere. Often you find things hiding under the stumps. Wow, that's really heavy. Remember to always put things back the way you found them, because they are habitats, natural shelters for the insects and other animals that live here. Is a lizard. They're not easy to catch, they're super fast. We're playing hide and seek. Ah. This time I was faster. Playing hide and seek with this type of animal is no joke. That's what they spend their lives doing. They've had plenty of time to practice. This is a desert spiny lizard, Scoropolis Magister. It's beautiful. It's got shades of blue on his scales. They're incredible. Don't bite now, that's very rude. It's not allowed. There, there, calm down. I'm going to put you in a bag and later on we'll do our photo shoot. There. Ah, that's cool. It's an agave americana. It's in bloom. This is a plant that lives a relatively long time, between 10 and 30 years. Interestingly, this plant collects energy and strength throughout its life so it can bloom, and once it has, it dies. So the interflorescence is the long stalk here with all the flowers at the tip. It can grow up to nine meters high. This one is just starting to grow. It's not very tall yet. Okay, I'll keep going. You can see some vegetation on the top of the rocks. Ah, this is typically the kind of hideout where you're likely to find creatures. Always check under the stones. Hey, hey. Come here, you. 
Oh, he's magnificent. This is Colionix variegatus, the only gecko in Arizona. These animals don't like to run. They're not hard to catch, but you rarely see them. They're usually active at night, sometimes in the morning, but during the day they hide under the stones or rocks. This is an adult. They're not very big. I'm going to put him in the bag because it's hot out here. I have to find a spot in the shade for my photo shoot under the big rock here. That should do the trick. I'll just check it's safe. You never know. It looks sturdy. OK, let's up the studio. Here, you have to behave like the animals. Find shade and hide from the sun. Use the environment like they do. They know how to live here, and you have to imitate them. Light test. OK, fine. So this is going to be a little delicate because these animals are very fast and it has been known to bite. And if it escapes, it'll almost be impossible for me to catch it again. We need to be good pals. Yeah, you have to calm down. This is a desert spiny lizard. It's omnivorous, which is rather uncommon for a lizard. It eats insects, ants, spiders, as well as scolopendrus. It can eat almost anything, providing it's a small invertebrate. And it also eats plants because it's omnivorous, which is seldom the case with lizards. You're really pretty, you know that? Hey, I'm not here to bug you. Well, just a little bit. The scales are incredible. They're very spiny and really stand out from those below. They overlap like tiles. You can even lift them up. There's one spine per scale. This is probably a male. His ephemeral paws along his hind feet. All right, he looks much calmer now. That doesn't mean he won't try and bite me. OK, I have my front shot, lateral shot of the head. All the scales are visible. This is a tricky moment because he's ready to escape, so I have to get him to calm down sufficiently so that I can take the photo of him on his back and on his belly. Oh, well, you've got to try. Now I have to catch him before he escapes. OK. It was cool. Whoa, not so cool. And don't bite. OK, so that was difficult. But the next one will be even more difficult because he's already on his belly. He's liable to hurtle away even faster. I'm all set. That was close. All right, I'm putting you back in the bag because you don't live here and I'm going to take you back home. Okay, the next one should be a little quieter. So, this is a very delicate lizard. I have to be very careful with it because it can lose its tail at any moment. It grows back, though, so it's not a problem for him. This is Colionix variegatus a small gecko species, the only one found in Arizona, and it's awfully cute. Their scales are so tiny they look like skin. So this one is more or less the opposite from the lizard that we just saw with the large scales that overlap and tiny tips, whereas this one is soft all over. OK, let's get on with the photos. Front shot. I'm going to zoom all the way in. Hi there. This is usually a night predator, but you can find them sometimes during the day. Its skin is translucid. It's as if you can see right through its ear to the other side of the head. You can see the light shining through. 
The belly shot might not be very easy, although he can't run very fast. I'm not really sure you'll like me on his back. There we go. OK, all the veins on, on the belly are visible. He's calmed down, finally. Good. Fantastic. Now, overall shot, turn over there. Quiet, stay there. The natural pose is perfect. No, no, no. Oh, he's beautiful. He's absolutely magnificent. Oh, his eyes are incredible, with a vertical pupil. It really looks like a predator. OK, now let's pick up and then release our little buddies. The good thing here is it's very dry. I don't need to worry about my gear. The downhill side, though, is where do you find water? I'm going to need some because I'm almost all out. In the jungle, you can find water everywhere. Here, it's difficult. You always need to have your hook handy in case you meet snakes. We're off again. And there you go. You're back home. I bet you like that little tree of yours. This must be a great spot. Go ahead. You can get out. There you're home. OK, thanks for the photos. Take care. There. We found your branch, your tree. You'll be fine here. But be careful. If you lose the next game of hide and seek, you might get eaten. Off you go. Don't waste any time. Arizona is a sacred land for the Native Americans, and reptiles are at the center of their beliefs. According to them, reptiles that shed their skin regularly are symbols of renewal, fertility, and eternity. I have to be careful, according to some legends, treading on a snake's tracks may have adverse health effects because some snakes are believed to be in close communication with the gods and the sun. There's a rattlesnake. Wow, he's beautiful. OK, let's see if I can get up to the studio and take the photos here. The black and white tail is easily distinguishable. This means this is a Crotalus atrox, the western diamondback rattlesnake. Oh, he's really beautiful. This is great. Stay here. Given his size, I'm not going to use the lower light box. What you hear is the caudal appendage rattling at a frequency of 9,000 hertz. Interestingly, he can't hear that sound. So common belief is that snakes don't have ears. They actually have an internal ear but no external canal, which means that they don't hear very well. They can only hear frequencies between 20 and 600 hertz, whereas humans can hear up to 20,000 hertz. So when he's rattling his tailbone like this, he's telling us, keep away. He won't come at me here, I'm safe. But if I try to approach him, he might attack me. This is music to my ears. All right. Come and get your photo taken. It's a bit tricky because of the bush. The last thing I want is to upset or hurt him. No, he won't hold on to the hook. He really doesn't want me to take him away. There we go. Roll up in a ball, beautiful. There, curl up. Perfect. I'm going to try to lift his head slightly. You never know, that might be better. I like it when they softly dart their tongue out to analyze the pheromones and smell all around to figure out who I am. I'm going to try with the tail. Yeah. Incredible. I'm going to take an overhead shot. There. 
He's identifiable by his black and white stripes and the lines by his eyes. They're typical of Crotalux atrox. The segments that he uses like rattles grow back after each sloughing. Here, for example, he has eight segments and the last one is broken, which means he has already sloughed eight times. Now for the head from above. My legs need to be at safe distance. At camera level, I'm relatively well protected. I'm trying to take the side shot of the head and I'm waving high to him. Don't be afraid, it's just for the photos. I'm going to grab the opportunity to take a close-up shot of the tail. That's also going to be included in the plate. Now, we can take our time to take a belly shot. All right, now I have to catch him and get him to relax on his back. OK, it's time to put you on your back, pal. This snake has large venom hooks. There. You can see them well. Its venom is hematoxic, which means that it affects the blood and the muscles and can cause severe necroses. You really don't want to have this kind of venom in your bloodstream. There, on the right, you can see that he has two hooks. Actually, there is a replacement hook already there to take the place of the one that's about to fall out. Like that, they always have a spare. There. And here, you can easily see the heat-sensitive dimples on the side of the head. There are two of them. And they're able to detect very slight changes in temperature, more precisely than a thermal camera would. So that means that they are much more efficient than our finest thermal camera technology. OK, it's time to take the photo of the back. You should be able to relax like that. There, you're starting to chill. There. Draw a nice S for me, that'll be much easier. You're big, so I should... Back up a bit. You'll be able to relax soon. I have one photo left and then I'll let you go. He's on his back and he's calm, but I need to group him together and apparently he doesn't like that. There, come on. That's nice. OK, I'm going to go and catch him. Come on. Don't you bite, that's rude. You're a good boy, usually. I'm a new buddy, you shouldn't bite me. Oof. He has incredible strength. I don't want to squeeze him too hard, you should always handle them gently. So. I'll stand next to my camera so I can catch him faster. Oh, that's not very nice of you. I'm going to work like this, it'll be easier. That's not bad at all. Let's prep the camera. There you go. You can't scare anybody anymore on your back like that. You can see he's quiet now. He's sticking his tongue out. He's breathing calmly and he stopped rattling. Every animal calms down eventually. Sometimes it takes time. If I move and he sees me, he'll start rattling again. As long as I don't move, he'll stay calm. All right, now I've finished my photo shoot, I'm going to let him go. And I'm really super happy because this is a famous North American rattlesnake. He's incredible. He's just absolutely beautiful. You have to admit they're a wonder of nature to be able to survive in such an environment. They can go without food for close to two years. Animals have five million years of evolution behind them, and they've always adapted to their environment. There. Do you recognize this place? 
That's your home. OK, if you don't mind, I'm going to pack up. I'm only a metre away from him. I know he won't attack me. Anyway, accidents always happen the same way, when people try to kill them or handle them without knowing how to go about it. As long as you leave them alone, they leave you alone. That's the rule. Well, I'm really glad I met you and see you next time. Maybe. I think I've found a place to sleep tonight. That little cave up there looks good. Wow, that's great. The ideal camp. With a five-star view, it's a great spot to sleep. It's beautiful. I may be here for the reptiles and frogs, but it doesn't take the beauty of the place away. And I'm fully enjoying it. Weather. I need to keep moving. I have to change areas. I'm going to the Sonoran Desert. I've already explored this place sufficiently. There are other species, other biotopes there. This view is really fabulous. I did well to sleep there. All right, off we go. Right now, I'm standing in the Madeira Canyon. This is a unique place in this area. Unlike the desert, you can find water here. It's actually a microclimate. There is five times more rain here than in the plains. And as soon as you get water like that, the biotope changes. There are trees, running water, and other species. This is the ideal spot to fill up my water flask. Here, you need to grab the opportunity when you can. That'll do me some good. OK, let's go. It's a rattlesnake. Hey, come here, you. I'd better put on my gloves. Come here. Look how beautiful he is. OK, he's poised to attack. That's Crotalus molossus. You can recognize them by their black tail. This is another rattlesnake. But it has a black tail as opposed to the Crotalus atrox, which has a black and white striped tail. And. One, two, three, four. He has about 10 broken segments, so he's relatively old. It's really lovely. I'm going to put him in the bag and open the studio. Come over here. Be quiet. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. 
Keep calm. That's not an option. Come on. There. There's venom here on the bag. Quite a lot of it, actually. It's not afraid of biting. Go on, get in the bag. There. It's sticky. I've got venom on my fingers. It's not dangerous because it's not transcutaneous. It doesn't permeate the skin. It's only dangerous if it reaches the bloodstream or the muscles. OK, I've found just the spot. We're going to do the photo shoot right here. All right, you'll be nice and comfy here while I prepare the studio. It can get a bit intense with this kind of animal because venom is no joke. And they're not afraid to bite. I'm not sure I'll manage to put him on the light box because he's rather big. It will all depend on his willingness to be photographed. The good thing about the light box is that it raises the shadows under the animal so you can see every detail of the scale. The Crotalus atrox was slightly too big. This one is just at the limit, let's see. With a little bit of luck, I'll get him to fit on the box. OK, everything is ready. Now I just have to take a picture of the rattlesnake. Let's see if he's calmed down. Always hold the bag with the gloved hand. He could bite me through the bag, so I have to be very careful. I always make sure to back away because he can come out and jump to the side. I'll give him a second to cool down. Usually when you touch the hind part of a snake, it takes off at full speed. There we go. This is a snake that doesn't hold very well on a hook because it tends to move forward, unlike arboreal snakes, which usually hang onto the hook and stay in place. Those are easy to handle. I'll put the hat on him. Maybe he'll like that. Or again, maybe he won't. This is rather a quick snake. You have to be very careful. It can change directions very quickly. Its striking distance is rather impressive. It can spring forward from here at roughly half the length of its body. That's about 60 centimetres. And it has a good spring too, so you're in the danger zone when you're less than 60 to 70 centimetres away, depending on the snake's position. Let's not forget these are Solonoglyphus snakes. They have a hypodermic-type fangs with a hollow canal inside that injects venom directly like a needle. This venom is hematoxic. It attacks muscles and blood and can cause hemorrhages and necroses. There. I'm going to let him quiet down in his curled-up position. With a little bit of luck, once I take the hat away, he'll be relaxed and I'll be able to take a nice overall shot. If you kindly let me take your picture... That's lovely. I'm going to come closer to photograph the head. I'm a little too close. He's not too happy. It's magnificent. He's darting his tongue to gorge me. When he sticks his tongue out, that means he's collecting the odour information in his environment. He has a special organ, Jacobson's organ, that he uses to analyse odour molecules. I need a front shot. What I'm doing is placing my gloved hand in front, so if he feels like biting, he'll bite the hand with the glove. Now, the most delicate shot is the profile shot, because he has a tendency to turn his head towards me. I'm going to take this and wave it at him from the other side. There. All that's missing is the belly shot. And that's a bit trickier. I'll try without the glass first. I'm putting both gloves on to calm him down. There. still need to be careful, though, because this is a very strong snake. Relax him on his side. Wow. This is a tricky moment because I need to let go of him. 
This is when he can turn around swiftly and try to bite, so I need to back away while I let go of him softly. It's a slightly complicated process. Let's see if he's willing to wait a bit before turning over. No. OK, then. I'll try with the glass. Come here. Well, how about you curl up in a nice ball for me? I know that the glass is not very big, but you never know, it might just work. Usually rattlesnakes like to curl up, don't they? There. That's not too bad. These animals are as beautiful as they are dangerous. Taken from this distance, I have all the ventral scales. Well, that's it then. I have everything I need for this plate. You can see the various segments here. There are signs of breakage here, which means he really should have more. His tail is broken at the seventh segment. Actually turns and twists at the same time, and that is what is sounding like a chanting noise. His short tail. Well, I'm done here. I'm going to free him. Now we can go back to his business and I to mine. OK, buddy, I'm done bothering you. Snakes are vertebrates. They have lots of ribs with small muscles in between to activate the crawling movement. Go on. Off you go. OK, he's facing me, typical rattlesnakes. They're not aggressive animals, but they defend themselves. And they've certainly got the means to do so. You're going to be a star in my cyclopedia. You should be happy. This is really rattlesnake country. 13 species live here in Arizona. Usually, this species can only be found on mountain slopes. Here, we're 1,800 meters above sea level. There are not many snakes that can live at such an altitude. It may be hot in the summer, but in the winter, it snows. So they hide in holes waiting for summer. Well, that was a great encounter. Thank you for not biting me. Also, I hope you'll find something to eat. A small rat or a baby rabbit. It gets chilly here at night and the sun is setting. I'm going to head back down to the plain. I have more chance of finding animals there. I'm in a dry riverbed. Actually, the only time you can find water here is for a few hours after a storm and then it dries up. But traces of humidity remain in the bottom of the riverbed, and that's where you can find amphibians. To find amphibians at night, look for the reflections in their eyes. They have what's called a tapetum lucidum, a sheet of reflecting cells that you can see from a distance. That's why we use the lamp to reflect light in their eyes. It's the best way to find them. There's something over there. Hello, you. Oh, boy. Scaphiopus couchy. It's really pretty. It's got beautiful eyes. Come on, in you go. I think there's a big one over there. Awesome. He's magnificent. He's huge. Hey there, where do you think you're going? I haven't done the photo shoot yet. Stay there. Encilius alvarius, the largest toad in North America. This is incredible. He's got paratrid glands, poisonous glands even on his feet. He's beautiful, spotty. He's got large eyes. OK, he's getting upset. He's releasing poison all over the place. I'm going to put him in the bag and set up the studio here. It won't take long, and then I'll leave you here, at home. 
These are really unusual animals. They've adapted to an environment where there's practically no water, although they desperately need it. It's pretty unlikely when you think of it. At night, I put a lamp on my camera. Like that, I can adjust the focus even in the dark. There, that's fine. OK, now I need to clean him up and make beautiful photos. Shower time. You should like that. There. Scaphophius cushi. So this is an incredible toad because it has developed unusual breeding techniques as opposed to most frogs and toads. It can lay its eggs in a pond and the eggs will hatch in less than 24 hours, which is really fast. And once the tadpoles develop, it's a race for life. They can come out in less than eight days, which is extremely short. Usually it takes several weeks, even months, and in some cases, years. There. If you would just stay on your back now. There. So, since they can't find water all year round, they are only active during the rainy season. Actually, they estivate for around 10 months a year and are active only for two months. They like termites and can eat huge quantities in very little time. Precisely, they eat huge quantities of termites in one or two days, and that will be enough for them to survive for a year. In terms of adaption, they're rather incredible. Eat two meals a year, and you're good for the rest of the year. And they also have a morphological peculiarity, a small spatula here which is as rigid as a nail. Actually, it's a small shovel that they use to bury into the ground. The animal is really adapted to his milieu, and what's more, he's super cute. He's got big eyes and a very nice colour. You, I didn't find you here, so back in the bag. There. Now, for Mr. Giant Toad. OK. Come over here. Take it easy. You're entitled to a shower also. There, there was a large toad with lots of toxins there. So, these toxins are not dangerous if they come in contact with the skin. However, they shouldn't be ingested or swallowed, nor touch mucous membranes such as the eyes. This is also an hallucinogenic toxin. In ancient times, Indians, shamans, would use it to bring on hallucinations, where they believed they met with the gods. What he's doing right now is producing the toxin on his back. He has large parotid glands and smaller glands all over his back. There, I'll start with the feet. He's trying to look enormous because he thinks I'm going to eat him. Don't worry, I'm not going to eat you. I just want some photos. There, the hind leg. OK, now I need the overall shot of the belly. And that's going to be a different kettle of fish because I don't think he'll like staying on his back. No, no, moving, come on. He needs to understand that I don't mean to hurt him. So these toads eat everything. They can eat mammals, such as small mice, anything that fits into their mouth, actually. They eat centipedes, scorpions, other frogs, insects. There, he's calmed down. Lateral shot, maybe from above. I need the front shot. So these amphibians' characteristic features is that they can live in a very dry environment. Among the amphibians of Arizona, this is one that can live in the driest of places. There, that's done. Beautiful. He looks good. OK, I'll take you back home now. There, that wasn't far. And thanks for the photos. Go on. Well, you certainly were a good boy. It was a pleasure doing a photo shoot with you. There. OK, I'll be moving on now. I'm going to set up a camp here for tonight. I need to get some sleep. I need to be rested for tomorrow. I'll take a look at my photos. That always fires me up for the next day. Crotalus molossus. You can clearly see the eyes, the scales. We're going to make some very nice plates. Let's look at the toads now. Oh, cool, I managed to get the nail. That's a hard part under the toad's hind foot. 
Here, without it, they can't bury into the ground for winter to weather the dry season. So these desert animals have adapted. I'm going to check if I got the eyes right. They really have very colored eyes. You can clearly notice all the tiny black vessels around the irises. They'll be great plates. OK, that's the big one, Ancilius alvarius. He's really a big boy. And the parroted glands on the hide legs have really intrigued me. I've never seen that before. That's quite visible here. And that face on him. What a grumpy looking mister. OK, I'm going to get some rest and tomorrow I'll travel to Cabeza Prieta Wild Refuge in the Sonoran Desert, close to the Mexican border. Here, every organism needs water, so when it rains, it's party time for everybody, even me. Good night. I'm in the Sonoran Desert, one of the hottest places in Arizona. Here, temperatures often go over 50 degrees. Regardless, the animals have adapted and developed extraordinary abilities. This is a good time to go looking for animals. It's not too hot yet. They are active and out in the sun. Check the bushes near the ground, all around. Well, here, for example, there's an anthill. There's a major food source for a good number of lizards. Hey, what's that? Well, that's interesting. This is Phrynosoma feces. Actually, they feed almost exclusively on ants, so their feces are easily recognizable. They're basically ant heads and bodies. So if there are feces, there's one nearby. They have a cryptical color, meaning that they blend into their environment. They'll match the substrate. Usually, this is the hour that they're out sunbathing. You need to canvas the area. Hey, here he is. Hey there, buddy. He's so beautiful. They know how to run. But that's not how they usually proceed. OK, so now he's puffing up. He's trying to look as large as possible, so I won't eat him. He's truly magnificent. OK, you're going in the bag? I'm going to try and find something else. It's early yet. There are prickles everywhere here. You need to watch where you put your feet. It's crazy, all the plants have developed spines. Ah, there's a small lizard. Oh, well, he's gone. There's nothing in his hole. That's impressive. It's probably a sanitarian. They grow very slowly and can live up to 170 years old. And the end of the rainy season, a cactus like this can hold several hundreds of litres of water. They're like vertical wells. That stings. OK. The environment here is beautiful. That's a dry riverbed. Hey, wow. That's great. This is a boa. You wouldn't know by looking at it. They're very sweet animals. They don't bite. And they don't have any venom. I don't think I'd find one because they're rather rare. That means it must have rained recently because they usually come out after the rain. Oh, it's beautiful. So this is a Lichenora trivigata, a rosy boa. They're constrictors like other boas, but this is an adult and he's clearly not a monster like the boa constrictor that can measure over three meters long. This one must be uh, 60 to 70 centimeters. It's already a good-sized adult. This is fun, a nice change from rattlesnakes. It's a different type of animal. Very delicate and not dangerous whatsoever. OK.
A few nice big cactuses to protect me from the sunlight should do the trick. OK, time for a photo shoot. There are fighter jets patrolling overhead because we're right next to the Mexican border. So it sort of disturbs the quiet of the desert, but well, we'll just have to make do. This area is called the wilderness. It's a place that's preserved from humans, which means that we're allowed to enter, but only on foot. No motor vehicles, no bikes allowed. We can visit, but we can't stay. OK, let's start with a little boa. Come and say hello. There. Sometimes the most delicate snakes are the hardest to photograph because they never stop wriggling. I think that's good. OK, I have my overall shot. I'm going to take some headshots. All right, let's do the front first. So they have a large rostral scale. That's the scale located on the snout between the nasal scales. They use it to push the substrate aside, so when they dig in the sand or the earth, it helps them get through easily. Oh, he's cute. Trivigata means three striped in Latin, so that means he's got three stripes. Unlike pythons, boa babies are already formed. That's why they're called oviviparous. The females have pockets inside their bodies in which the young develop. And when they're ready for parturition, that's like giving birth for snakes, the baby snakes come directly out of the pockets. They're fully formed and off they go to lead their own lives. So unlike pythons that lay eggs, that's really an incredible method of reproduction. OK, I'm going to take the belly shot. Come on. Curl up in a ball. Yep, that's perfect. Isn't he beautiful? There. I've got the ventral shot. They have a rather wide tail, so actually the tail starts at the cloaca, that's the anal opening. You can tell because the anal scale is wider. And then comes the tail. Well, you've been super cool. You've let me do a great photo shoot. They're really beautiful animals. OK, I'll put you back in the bag because you don't belong here. So now we're moving on to a very different kind of animal, Phrynosoma solare. This is a horn lizard. He's full of spines, all around his head and all over his body. So now he's puffing up to show me he's too fat for me to eat him. He's really full of spines. OK, I'm going to take a profile headshot. With the close-up shot, you can make out all the details of the horns. There's the top. I've just seen something with the zoom lens. In the middle of the head here, he has what's called a pineal eye, and that's a third eye. The eye is sensitive to light, and it can sense changes in luminosity. It doesn't see as precisely as a regular eye that can make out every detail, but it helps him with assessing the luminosity so that the lizard can find the best spot in the sun to warm himself or to adjust his body temperature. He also has a function in hormonal production. It triggers the reproduction hormones to help him breed at the right time of year. OK, so I'm going to take the ventral shot, if you'll let me. You don't know what it's like to be on your back, do you? Relax. There. Belly shot done. So, what we see here are the femoral pores along the feet and a bump on the tail. This means he's a male. And a large, good-sized male at that. He's puffing up to try and impress me, but it's really not working. OK, I don't want to bother him. I'll just move around and we'll take the last shot. Oh, he's magnificent. I love the horns all around his head. They're incredible. This lizard has a unique feature. He can spurt blood from his eyes. 
Actually, the blood pressure in his eyes rises to the point of bursting a blood vessel, and he can aim the spurting blood at his aggressor. He usually does this to canids, namely coyotes or dogs. That's how he pushes them away. He spurts the blood on the dog's or the coyote's mouth. He uses it as a repellent. Right now, he's not stressed enough to do that kind of thing, but it's his weapon of last resort. So his first weapon is to blend into his environment. The second one is to play dead. And if that doesn't work, he can spurt blood from his eye. OK, my journey finishes with you. You're going to be one of the stars of the encyclopedia. When you think desert, you imagine a desertic, arid place. But actually, that's not true at all. Deserts teem with life. The animals have managed to adapt to arid environments such as this one. And here, there is diversity and quantity. A new adventure. This trip to Arizona has more than met my expectations. I've added 31 reptile and amphibian species to the encyclopedia and seven rattlesnake species out of the 13 that live in this state.